Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Stephanie. Happy to be your host today, and I'm happy that you joined the session. My name is Mangele Msweli, currently Senior Manager of the Youth Leadership Program at the African Wildlife Foundation. I will be your host today. I'm joined by two guests who know a lot more than me about the topic we had, so they'll be doing most of the talking. Uh, we're joined by Andrea from the African Wildlife Foundation, who's the Senior Director for uh, Business Engagement in Europe. We're also joined by Dr. Francis, who is the um, Director for the African Wildlife Economy Institute at Stellenbosch University. And he's also the academic director for the School of Wildlife Conservation at the African Leadership University. Now to start us off, what is biodiversity economy? I will hand over to your side, uh, Francis. Oh, you want me to start? Okay. Yes. With what's, it's an economy that uses the living natural resources. It creates, uh, you provide goods and um, services out of the use and ideally the sustainable use of nature. Okay. Yes, you're welcome and you can go through your broader presentation. Oh, sure. Okay. How do I turn it on? Um, the close to your mic button, there is a button for sharing presentation on the oh, side. There it is. Haha. -ha. So this is okay. Sure. Okay, I've got a. Can we share this with the with the participants later? Yes. Uh, also okay. see it's this side now. Okay, let me get to the top slide. Um, okay, so that's me, and I'm I'm just I'm wearing two hats because I'm going to use the term wildlife economy, which is another way of saying biodiversity economy, and um, it's become a bit popular in the African context. Um, and what I've um, as you just pointed out that there's two institutes that I'm related with in, in Africa at the moment, and both are in this space. The one on the left, the Inst Wildlife Economy Institute is more of a research initiative, and the one on the right is a training initiative. And um, in fact, uh, we've had some really good folks from African Wildlife Foundation at the African Leadership University. So one of the first things, I'm just gonna do about four or five slides and then I'll shut up. but. If you want to understand the wildlife economy, you got to think about what conservation is all about. And many people today think conservation is about protection. But what I've put up here on this slide is the original definition of conservation put together by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, of nature where Andrea and I used to work many years ago, and um, before we sort of both got hooked on Africa. And if you read this definition, you can see where the work and the jobs opportunities are. Conservation is about management. It's about management of the use of the biosphere. Now, back when this definition was crafted, the word biodiversity didn't exist. And use it so that it may yield the greatest sustainable benefit to present generations while maintaining its potential to meet the needs and aspirations of future generations. So to responsible management of nature and natural resources uh, for our benefit. And it includes preservation, which most people think is a synonym, but also includes maintenance, sustainable util utilization, restoration, and enhancement of the natural environment. So right there, you can see the job opportunities in the sector are about management of the biosphere for benefit. Now, this is a lot of words on one text, but if you, if you take a copy of this little presentation, this is interesting to read because it goes back to 1980 when the first big strategy was put out on conservation. And again, the, the job opportunities in here are quite obvious to maintain ecological processes and light support systems on which we depend and development depends, to prefer, preserve genetic diversity that's important for industries, um, for domesticated animals and so on. And, and the bottom one is on sustainable use. So I'll, I'll read that one through. The sustainable utilization of species, notably fish and other wildlife, forests and grazing lands, which support millions of rural communities as well as major industries. So it's about the use of nature for human benefit from the rural community to big business across the spectrum of the economy. And in that last one, just to make it clear, wildlife is not just about four-legged animals in national parks. It's also about fish. It's also about plants. 
Um, it's about the landscapes and the ecosystems in which they interact as well. So we've now gone from that old definition to a more modern definition of a wildlife economy, and we call it an economy that utilizes undomestic animals and plants and the ecosystems in which they live to produce goods and services for human benefit. So how can you use the landscape and the animals and the plants on that landscape responsibly, sustainably for our benefit? So if you will, wildlife economy is just a new way of saying wildlife conservation. I'll give you one example of what this is like in the States, and then the next slide will be one in, in Africa. So for example, in the US, the Colorado Wildlife Council um, says that they generate over 3 billion US dollars a year just from hunting and fishing. And there's more than 25,000 jobs. Just in one state out of 50 states, there's a $3 billion economy just in harvesting animals through hunting and fishing and there's 25,000 jobs created. You can add the tourism on top of that, you can add the timber on top of that, and you can see in the, even in one state how big the wildlife economy is for that state. Now this slide um, is from one of the reports that we've done at the African Leadership University. We've done a, a case study on South Africa. We've also done one on Kenya and a couple other countries and a big report on the state of the wildlife economy. The last slide has the links to the websites where you can get it. And I just would put this up just to give you the, the range in which there's opportunities. The first one on the left, wildlife ranching. There's about 9,000 private wildlife ranches in South Africa. And they're contributing the estimates we have about $438 million a year. There's stacks of job opportunities on these ranches. And these ranches are actually involved in everything else that's on the slide. They do tourism, they do hunting, they do wildlife trade, they do fish, fisheries, et cetera. Um, so there's a huge, big private sector engagement next to the national park system in the country. Ecotourism obviously is one that we all think about when we think about a wildlife economy. It's a very big sector. South Africa is no different. They estimated it about a $6 billion sector in the economy, both a big sector for domestic tourism and then for international tourism. Of course, the COVID pandemic has put a knock on that, but it'll come back. Wildlife trade, the interesting one at the bottom, it says in 2018, Sand Parks, which is the South African national parks, the government parks, made $1.3 million from selling uh, wildlife. So it's not just the private sector that's involved in the, in the wildlife economy, the public sector is involved with it. The park system sells live animals, they sell meat, they sell um, uh, concessions for use, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a big export, both um, internally, they es estimate that the exports are over a billion dollars a year. This is legal trade. We're not talking about the illegal trade. That's another part of the economy that none of us want to go into. This is just legal trade. Hunting's huge huge in South Africa. It's a big economy, about $800 million a year. And the interesting thing is about 85% of that is local revenues. It's local hunting. Uh, much Only about 15% is, is the international trophy hunter. It's what local hunters, just like you have in North America and in Europe, that go and hunt on the weekends, bring meat home, and so on. Fisheries is also big. I think it's bigger in other countries in the continent, but it's a big, big part of the industry there. And then there's filming, photography, there's non-timber forest products, honey is an example, and there's this increasing interest in carbon finance from, from conserving um, areas and restoring areas and so on. So restoration and carbon finance is a big one. So there in South Africa, there are tens of thousands of people working in the wildlife economy. Anything from the ranching business to trading animals live to tourism to hunting and so on. So pathways, management, production, utilization, and trade, stacks of um, opportunities. Those are just some examples. And I'll close with just a statement what we're doing in Kenya at the moment. We've been involved with the wildlife economy dialogue. We've had five stakeholder dialogues in Kenya, and we'll do the multi-stakeholder one later this month. So we've talked with public officials, with communities, with the private sector, with the NGOs, including AWF, of course, and um, with um, the development partners. And the whole focus here is on how to unlock Kenya's wildlife economy to move beyond tourism to create more job opportunities. So in countries like Kenya that may not be as 
developed in South Africa, watch this space. Kenya will be on the map with a much bigger wildlife economy, I think, in the next few years. So it's an exciting area to work across the continent, and I'll shut up with that. Thank you so much. I'll definitely come back to you during the discussion session, but I have a quick question before I move to Andrea. You've mentioned that there's a lot of private sector engagement um, as well, uh, especially when it comes to wildlife ranging and so forth. Do we see youth getting involved in the space? Are there, if we take a case study of South Africa, are there any institutions or initiatives, government-led or otherwise, that are there to try and, um, and empower youth and local communities to participate more actively in the sector? Yes, there are, and but you know the South. You're from South Africa, so you know the big d dynamic in South Africa is transformation. So it's it's not just youth, but to move this economy into the mainstream of society. So much of the economy has been traditional white South Africans, and so there's a big discussion around of how to give more of those ranches owned by black South Africans and get them involved. In that context, youth are really important. So there's lots of training going on at universities. Um, the universities have programs, then people get apprenticeships into the um, game lodges around Kruger Park, into the hunting concessions and so on. Um, um, there's a black South African Hunters Association, for example. So there's a big push. Now, in other parts of the country, it's not so much a transformation, but youth is important. So what we're doing at African Leadership University, we have an undergraduate conservation track to take students as undergraduates and learn how to become leaders in the sector so that they'll move into the sector right from the university degree. Um, Outside the university, you have programs like the Southern African Wildlife College in South Africa near Kruger and Moika, which is just at the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, which then also train people in more of the professions, being a ranger, being a hunter, and so on. And there's also a college, and I can't remember the name in Cameroon. It's a francophone college that um, um, is another of the training colleges. So oh. yeah, there are programs, public and private and academic. Garawa in Canada. Garawa, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that overview. And I hope for everyone who's listening is starting to get an idea that there's opportunities from the academic side of things and otherwise when with those examples you gave. Now, Andrea, for now, I'm going to move over to your side. How is impact investment supporting biodiversity economy in Africa? You are muted. And my presentation's up and I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and okay. I can see the presentation. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I don't know, depending on where people are, it seems to be a real global show um, as a session. Um, it's a real pleasure to join this panel and talk to um, you know, a group of youth about the potential for a biodiversity economy um, in Africa in specifically, but, but also thinking about that more globally. I've been asked to talk a bit about the role that investment can play in stimulating a green economy or a biodiversity economy. But before I go into the detail of the investment, I just want to take a step back and look at what we're aiming for in terms of a real transition of the economic model in a way that supports people in nature. I think we heard that in the panel session that was just preceding this and the need for rethinking kind of our systems of, of consumpt consumption and production in a fundamentally different way where we're instead of attract, extracting resources, we're looking at ways that the economy can sustain people and reinvest in the core biosphere that's underpinning all life on earth and i really like this model of the sustainable development goals that was put together by um Rockstar, rockstrom and the and the um stockholm resilience center because it it really speaks to kind of the nesting of how the economy needs to work in service to people and the biosphere which is very much what we think needs to happen in the next transformation of the economic model across Africa. So at, at African Wildlife Foundation, we're focused 
on making sure that people are the center of efforts to protect and restore nature. And when you talk about Africa's population, you have got to address youth as a core part of it. And we're blessed to have Simangela leading our youth program at the African Wildlife Foundation and driving the real shift that we see for sustainability um, on the continent. 65% of Africans, pop, Africa's population in um, 2050 will be under the age of 35. That's a billion people that are coming in and that's a source of inspiration, of entrepreneurship and of, of real um, growth for the continent. It's, it's Africa's greatest asset. Um, so how do you combine that um, youth uh, with opportunity for biodiversity economy? Looking into impact investment, uh, we see investment as a leverage opportunity for driving a shift in, in economic um, uh, development around protected areas. And here I will say that we broaden the definition beyond kind of the focus that Frank very rightly pointed out that's specifically about wildlife use um, to look at how economies in landscapes that are wildlife rich function to restore that under underpinning ecological system. And some of the some of the economic um, drivers for change can be linked to agriculture production or fisheries production or forestry and non timber forest product harvesting, beekeeping, um, but also also wildlife use in in that context. When about 10 years ago, we um, we started to look at how we could leverage finance as an incentive for the emergence of wildlife economies or biodiversity economy in a landscape um, and use uh, investment to stimulate growth in a whole sector of the economy that um, was fundamentally contributing back to biodiversity conservation, what we call conservation enterprises, which are fundamentally businesses that have embedded within them um, a, a, a positive relationship back with the environment um, writ, writ large. So we established a, an investment vehicle called African Wildlife Capital. We invested, actually the, the numbers are a bit wrong on the slide, I apologize for that, but we invest, invested nine, uh, sorry, $7 million over um, nine enterprises in the tourism and agriculture sectors um, in 14 different countries and tested the road for the way that uh, finance and, and investment can um, build in conservation measures as a part and parcel of the investment um, uh, deal with the, with the companies. Um, and the result of that was actually quite positive from perspective of um, biodiversity outcomes. It meant that the businesses that we were investing in had a healthy relationship with the underpinning ecosystems of biodiversity that they were dependent on. It also meant that jobs were created that directly linked back to the surrounding environment and that people in the, in the um, jobs and marketplaces um, around these businesses were um, uh, incentivized to, to really maintain the forest and wetland and, and um, wildlife corridor systems that they were living alongside of. So it worked. So now what are we doing? Well, um, having learned what it takes to, um, to, to make investments um, incentivize conservation in a way that creates jobs and, op and economic opportunity, we're now at the point where we're partnering with a, a real venture or real capital um, firm called Okavango Capital um, just to establish uh, a, a larger fund, a fund that will have a first capitalization of $40 million, um, which will uh, really take this investment model to scale across um, five different countries, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, or Zambia. Um, and against uh, gr across four different sectors, agriculture and tourism still on the table, but in addition to that, finance and clean tech. And there's some various reasons why we're expanding to include those additional sectors, in part related to the market growth and potential that we see for return from those sectors. So we're scaling what we've learned through African Wildlife Cap Capital through this partnership with Okavango Capital. And the types of companies that we're looking at with this investment actually come back to you as youth across the continent. And 
just to pull out kind of one in the in the portfolio of the pipeline African Eats, which is which is a company that actually on let or, or on invest onward invests into agriculture um, transformation across the continent. So so this is a a, a group that actually um, invests in um, fledgling companies with the idea of growing them to a stage of investment that would be a more direct investment through Okavango. And the idea that um, that this that this creates is the is the role that um, onward on financing can play in growing micro enterprises, small enterprises, new enterprises to a stage of capital um, or to a stage of, of development that really has the scaled impact that we're needing to see. So at African Wildlife Foundation, we're actually looking across a number of different um, sort of segments of the investment framework um, from incubators and angel investors through to impact investors, which is what I would describe Okavango Capital as, through to venture capital and banks, and looking at how we can embed conservation covenants and conservation thinking into all of those stages of investment, recognizing that every stage of growth and maturity of the business cycle has the potential to have a positive relationship back with biodiversity. Um, and there is a lot to work with here. Um, this is a little bit daunting, frankly, if you're looking at it from a straight um, to-do list perspective. But this, you know, across Africa, the investment landscape of, of those angel investors, the family offices that are active on the continent, the growth and, and private equity funds, seed funds and venture capitalist funds are numerous. And there's a real potential for leveraging all of this body of investment to drive a different kind of agenda in terms of conservation outcomes. So in summary, we're investing in, in youth, Afri in young African entrepreneurs in ways that can reshape the role that wildlife and wildlands have in Africa's development trajectory. And we see business as, as a partner in the solutions that are going to be needed to scale and uh, succeed when it comes to embedding conservation and and biodiversity in the development um, aspirations of the continent. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. And of course, a quick one for you while I'm waiting for more questions from our audience. Uh, with the Okavango Capital, uh, are you looking more into already existing businesses that want to change the way they work so that they have access to resources? Or is it more of new upstarting businesses that can um, have access to resources? Yeah. So Okavango itself is the fund that we're establishing with Okavango is targeting larger established enterprises. And the reason for that is the economics of fund management around what you need in terms of return of, of um, um, in terms of supporting the businesses and getting the loans out. So we're looking at at loan sizes that are in the in the two to five million dollar range. And in order to have a loan size of that amount, you have to have a company that has a market capitalization that's pretty mature already. Um, the other thing that we learned in terms of the African wildlife capital um, piece of things is that um, when you when it comes to a, an in, impact investment fund management, um, having smaller deal sizes means that it's very difficult to service those deals. Um, and having and investing in early stage companies makes it very difficult to raise the level of capital that we're looking for in terms of 40 million for the first close and 70 million for the for the final close. However, said that, um, we do see great potential for early stage businesses and um, and absolutely there's a role for um, newer entrepreneurship and and um, innovation within the sector and that's why it's a different kind of partnering it's a it's about partnering with incubators it's about partnering with um, angel investors it's about partnering with those pieces of the finance sector that are targeted for getting new ideas onto market and growing them in those early stages. So eventually they could mature into the stage where they could be taking on loans from, from the likes of Okavango. So we don't, just because Okavango is targeting that, that doesn't mean 
we have different horses for different courses, I guess is the way I'd say it. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go over back to you, uh, Francis. We have a lot of young people who are still at university taking conservation courses, but sadly, in most cases, they look at conservation in a traditional way. You did touch a bit that you have a program with the undergraduate students um, at ALU, where you start exposing them to those things. For some of our participants who are most likely students, would you love to unpack a bit about the undergraduate program that you have at ALU and what kind of your undergrad students get exposed to? Okay, the, um, we do this with both the undergraduate students at the African Leadership University and with an MBA program. So in, in both cases, what we do is we focus on, if you will, the business of conservation. So we don't teach science. We, we don't actually teach about the zo you know, zoology or biology or ecology. We teach finance, marketing, um, policy, management and so on so one of the classes they'll take is a course called conservation area management and they'll look at public private and community-based management programs what works and what doesn't work how to manage a landscape and then in that we look at conservation in terms of the definition i gave kind of managing a landscape for human benefit not managing the landscape for the elephants and the lions but managing it for people and managing we those species and those those ecosystems for people. We have um, a course on finance. So we what we look at what Andrea was just talking a lot about is different financing models and the challenges of scale and need and um, whether we'd look at equity models and debt models and how to actually move away from the aid dependency of the sector around the continent. We look at the policy dynamics between different conventions and their impact. For example, trade. Um, export of trade. Um, we had our, our students exposed to a rhino farmer that I know well in South Africa. He has about 500 rhinos. He's up in Limpopo. And he wants to sell his product to the Asian market, but he's not allowed to, not by the, the, the convention in Geneva, but by his own government in Pretoria. They won't allow the product to be sold, which is the rhino horn. So we look at that. We have him talk to the students, say, this is my case. And you go, well, do we really want to do this or not? Um, and so we, we go um, and we we take the students on virtual field trips right now. We had one last week looking at programs in the career in South Africa to make the landscape, this is more along what Andre was just talking about, make the landscape more resilient for predators with the sheep farming in the Karoo. And how do you create a space for jackals and, and so on in the sheep farming? And what type of technologies do you use and so on? So that's what we do. We And we also finally internships. Um, we're committed to try and get the students on three internships, one a year with an African Wildlife Foundation or a South African National Parks or a Singita Hotels or what have you, so that they go and get stuck in somewhere and, and see how the industry works and come back and brainstorm it. So that's sort of our program. It's, we, we look at conservation as an economic sector. You know, and um, and just like any other economic sector, you don't want to just kill the golden goose. You want to keep it and build it up, but look at it as a way to create jobs. There you go. Yeah, thank you so much. The way you explained it to make me wish I could go back to undergrad again. Come and do our MBA. <laughs> Some of your colleagues. So. Are. I'll consider Next that. is in October. <laughs> I'll consider that and everyone who's listening. Ask Edwin uh, in the Washington <laughs> office. He'll tell you about it. Yes. So um, Andrea Francis has touched on this a bit. He started touching on an environment that you need in order for the biodiversity economy to operate. And one of the things he touched on was policy, of course. Would you love to shed more light? What is What are some of the things that are required either from a government level to ensure that we have an environment that allows the biodiversity economy to strive? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <You can have laughs> in, in short, no, it's, it, and it's where we started actually, where the governance framework is absolutely essential. No economy exists without any kind of governance framework. So a, a free market doesn't really exist on this planet. So you have to have 
uh, a framework that empowers um, businesses and, and entrepreneurs to exist, to thrive, to create their business. So some of the basic market conditions are, you know, can, can you establish a business? How long does it take? What's the red tape? Um, can you get investment? Can you make your business grow? Um, but then also there's a layer of, um, uh, of regulation around around biodiversity and the relationships back to biodiversity that Frank's been alluding to in, in, in his intervention. So what's allowed in terms of use? Um, what's the ownership regime in terms of the, of the wildlife or, or the wetland or the, um, you know, the, the, the element of biodiversity that you're trading, that, that, the, the discussions that are happening right now in the context of the Convention on Biodiversity on um, digital sequencing of genetic information is a, is fundamental around ownership over the over the over the rights and benefits from derived from the use of that um, digital sequencing. So um, those baseline conditions will set the framework that either enables and incentivizes conservation and sustainable use, or kills the market. Um, and getting those incentives right and making sure the benefits flow as locally as possible where it matters most is the most important thing. So making sure that the benefits go to the people who have to take the action that determines whether or not the species or the, or the habitat or the, or the biome is, is managed well. And what I would say is that lots of times our systems are geared towards making benef benefits flow upwards rather than downwards into into the pockets of people who take those decisions and who live with the consequences of those decisions in terms of human wildlife conflict or um you know having having an elephant in one's front yard um it, it, you it, eating your maize that's your food for the next year has significant consequences. If you don't see any benefit from having that elephant as part of your life, then you, you're gonna wanna ext exterminate it. And, and the problem that we have in, in many places where we work across Africa is that there's no return on, on that, um, you know, to, to, to people who actually live with the consequences of living with wildlife. Mm. Thank you so much um, for that, Andrea. I know, Francis, earlier on, you made an example of South Africa with a lot of projects that are happening, but I would love to assume that there are projects in other parts um, of Africa. Would you enlighten us a bit more? What other countries are actually leading in the space of biodiversity economy um, in Africa? And you did emphasize that in South Africa, there is a strong um, hunting sector as well which we know is probably not the same for other countries. What are type of uh, businesses that are gaining favor in the other countries in Africa? Okay. Um, oh boy, you go around the continent, but um, let's just start with Southern Africa first, but we'll move out of there quickly because everybody talks about Southern Africa. The, the model that's in South Africa actually comes from Zim. And, and uh, Andrea talked about governance and property rights. What happened in Zimbabwe years ago was the game, this is when it was still Rhodesia. And the game was coming onto the white farmer's land and eating the grass, which meant the grass wasn't available for their cattle. So they went, the farmers then sued the government and said, if your animals, your wild animals are gonna come on our grass, um, our property and eat our grass, you have to pay for it because we are now, what do you call it? We, we are now losing the grass for our, our livestock, for our cattle. And they won, they won the lawsuit. So the government was required to pay the farmers for the grass, right? Um, and they couldn't do that, they didn't have the money to do that. So they said, turned around and the government said, well, you can keep the wildlife, it's yours. You can do what you want with it. Then out of that with the old white farmers, community people got together and said, well, we can do this also for the communities, for the black communities. This is still in the Rhodesia. And they started campfire 
communal area management program for indigenous resources, which said that the communities could own their wildlife. So that then spread. Now it's it, that's fallen apart a bit in Zim, but it's strong in South Africa. Um, Namibia is another one. Namibia is a very big developed industry, and about half of the meat in Namibia now is wild meat. So it's it's that's people eat venison. They don't just eat factory farm chickens. They eat good, fresh, organic wild meat. Botswana is somewhere in between because most of the land is owned by the government. But Botswana has um, some private land, has some hunting concessions and so on. Mozambique's got everything on paper. It can do everything. It's very sophisticated on paper, but Mozambique's governance right at the top is a problem. They're just getting things organized there. They have hunting concessions like you'd have timber concessions. Going further north, TZ Tanzania does some hunting and ecotourism, and they've just legalized wildlife ranching in Tanzania, but nobody has a clue if it's going to be well governed. It's just happened. Um, Rwanda, where the African Leadership University is, is located, which is a little tiny country. Rwanda is the size of Kruger Park but with 14 million people in it. So it's a tiny little place. They, they've they been very good on their ecotourism stuff. Um, they've got African parks running their main parks now. Um, but, um, and AWS has been involved with a big project with communities by the gorillas, a really good project. And now they're looking at bringing in ranching and hunting there. They're having serious looks at opening it up. Kenya, I mentioned earlier, Kenya, Kenya first of all has a hunting industry, but it's only on the coast. It's called fishing. They, you can hunt animals as long as they swim, but if they're on four legs running around, you can't hunt them. Um, and so they do have, and they have sport fishing too, and people come in and do trophy fishing in Kenya, both in Lake Victoria and on the coast, and it's a big industry. So you now what's happening in Kenya is a discussion around opening up ranching and game farming. In fact, it's in the act that's under discussion in livestock, not just in the wildlife act. So there's a real potential, but they're going to try and do it without hunting because they've got the stigma in Kenya about hunting. We'll see what happens. Going further west, you can go to um, Nigeria. Nigeria's got a, a couple big parks that are just spectacular. I'd love to go to them. Um, that they're now looking at doing things like hydropower because of forested parks, um, non-timber forest products, shea butter, and some ecotourism. But they aren't the savannah parks of East and Southern Africa. Um, so you have a little bit different discourse going on in West Africa with that, with those types of parks. Um, there's there's very developed hunting in, in Cameroon, but the parks need a lot of work in Cameroon. Um, I'll give one the final thing, and I'll just give an example to link back to Andreas working with who's on the landscape stuff. There's a part of um, Nigeria called Ogani land. It's almost like Okavango, but it's very different than the Okavango. Ogani land is right out of Port Harcourt. Um, Shell, the big oil company, was there. They closed down 25 years ago their operations because it was just a mess. The last 10 years, they tried to do restoration of mangroves in the area. They've spent $500 million in the last 10 years, and they're not going to try and do it again because it didn't work the first time. So some of these big companies actually do put out a lot of money, but they don't always get it right. And I think it comes down to Andrea's word, governance. It's not the science. It's getting the relationships right between the public sector, the private sector, and so on. So the um, what do you call it? There's real interesting examples all over the place. Last one I'll give you and I'll shut up, Egypt. The whole Red Sea of Egypt has developed a very interesting self-sufficient ecotourism industry that's all tied around protecting the Red Sea and the coral reefs and the fish and everything. So it's, it's, it's around the continent. Thank you so much for that um, um, overview. Of course, coming from South Africa, more familiar with that context, but to hear what is happening in East Africa and West Africa and the North the really gives a bigger picture. And Final one from Andrea. She lives in Switzerland. I don't know if you can still get it at the Manor, but you could get wild harvested coffee in Switzerland. That's wow. the wildlife economy. So it's it's coffee, not from the Kenyan plantations, but from natural coffee mm -hmm. forests. You pay a bit of money for it, but it's pretty cool. You buy actual wild coffee in the shops in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. They come from Ethiopia. That's mm -hmm. another example of the wildlife economy. Yes. Thank you so much. My bugs in Switzerland. Hmm? Wild harvest bugs now as well. Insects. There you go. Wow. Um, I'm checking our Q&A section. 
I think one of the questions was kind of answered. Tendai, you can let me know if you think it's not. We had a question on what factors would determine the, determine the, the success of a country's white life biodiversity economy. I think we just unpacked the issue of governance. We unpacked the policy environment. We unpacked the need for private and public sector relationships that allow that. We've unpacked um, an, an environment, Andrea, that allows people to start businesses and have access to resources for those. But if you still think you not can answer tender, you're welcome to do a follow-up. Um, we then spoke about uh, governance and we have a question of, um, in addition to the responsibility of governments, is there a certain responsibility you see in youth as well? What youth, uh, what can youth do for a biodiversity uh, economy? I see you've started responding, Andrea, so I'll start on your side for you to unpack on that one. We were going to get to the answers of the questions in the conversation, so I, I was typing away. Trying to <laughs> so uh, I see, um, I see incredible potential, or I, I, I see an incredible role for youth in terms of um, governance and accountability, um, and particularly with mobilizing social media networks and being. Um, uh, the eyes and ears on the ground um, in terms of what happens. And I'll go back to some of the, maybe less on the biodiversity economy, but more on kind of the, the flip side of it is what we used to call the brown economy and, and sort of um, what happens in places. Um, and, and one could broaden the definition to actually say that some of the brown economy could have a positive relationship back to the biodiversity economy. I'm thinking of extractive industries, for example, where you have um, oil and gas development or infrastructure development that's intended to, um, or that has a negative re residual impact on biodiversity or lasting impact on biodiversity and needs to um, put in place the measures that safeguard against those impacts, um, mitigation measures they're called. And, um, and oftentimes it is a sort of robust EIA process, uh, environmental impact assessment, sometimes it's not so robust, um, but you'll have that process of deciding what are the impacts and how can they be mitigated and what measures need to be put in place. And then, and then it all goes quiet and the company goes forward and does what they do and, you know, that thing sits on a shelf someplace and doesn't get looked back at. Um, and um, and even though government signed off that says we our our approval of this development is conditional upon you know these agreements being implemented, um, often they're not implemented. And I think there's a real role of um, youth and social media and the leverage that you have um, with the sheer numbers in the continent in terms of really reshaping those relationships and power dynamics around. Um, around what what constitutes good practice um, and and implementation and making sure that the um, agreements are upheld. Um, there's a, we have another question in the chat by um, um, Bakang. I hope I didn't butcher your name. <laughs> um, I think it's it's linked to a point you touched earlier on, uh, Francis, when you gave an example uh, of Zimbabwe, how the white life will then get out and eats people's grass and that becomes the conflict. And you touched also, Andrea, that when people don't see the value in that white life, then less likely they wouldn't participate in conservation. So the, prob the question is, do you think the human wildlife conflict problem started when protected areas were set up? Humans and wildlife used to live in harmony and the setting up of protected areas reduced the threats brought on wildlife by modernization, but disturbed the peace. The disconnect created then has continued to bring problems of communities not finding value in the areas they live in because they aren't even allowed to manage them. Um, it is a question slash comment. I will come to your side firstly, Francis, to get your your insights and reflections on that. We could be all we could be till sunrise on this one for sure. Um, it's a, it's a very big topic and very important topic. Um, the 
uh, the, the, let's take Kenya, for example. The, the Brits come into Kenya in the 1890s. Before that, you had about 200 years of Portuguese and, and Omani influence and control in the country. The Brits then start hunting in the country, and then they start to realize they need to hunt. I mean, you need to manage hunting. So the National Park Systems of Kenya comes out of hunting reserves and controlling hunting. The Brits come in in the 1890s. They leave in the 1960s, only there for 75 years. But they set up the National Park System. I don't think the National Park System really caused a human-wildlife conflict. I think what it did do is set aside areas. I mean, there's dark side to all these these parks. And while I'm coming from the state, so does Andrea. We have a whole history of, of American imperialism, what we did to the indigenous people in North America with our park system. But it's not not necessarily that. I think there's other things. I, I, Andrea mentioned one with, how, what do you do with an elephant in your farm? You know, if you can't utilize it and the thing's going to mess up your, your, your maize field, you're probably going to want to get rid of it, right? So it's... But if you could actually do something with the elephant, ecotourism, hunting, meat, hide, elephants are valuable, ivory, then you might want to keep them around. So one of the problems is how do you incentivize a landowner to live with wildlife? Right now, um, one of the hot ones that's been talked about in Kenya, since you're in Kenya, is the um, avocado farm at, at uh, Amboseli National Park. So it's in a wildlife corridor but there's no money in wildlife quarters, but there's money in avocados. And there's a lot of people in the city, probably you, you, you as well, that would like avocado on your salad. So there's a guy out there farming out of avocados. Now, if he could farm kudu or he could farm impella, he might do that, but he can't, but he can't farm avocados. So the kudu, the impella, they all disappear and the avocado comes in, put big fences around, keep the wildlife out. And that doesn't really have anything to do with the national park. The national, it has to do with the landowner not having any way to make money off of the wildlife or to make a living off of the wildlife or to figure out ways to be compatible with them. So I don't think it's the parks per se. Uh, and I'll end with what I do think it is, and this is very controversial, but I like to push this out. I think it's prosperity. I think what's what's killing wildlife in Kenya is that the country's getting wealthy and wealthy people want good food on their table. They want meat, they want vegetables, they want good building materials, they want clothes. So the landowner out there is now has a customer and that customer isn't demanding wildlife, it's demanding livestock. It's demanding uh, food crops. And so they're converting the land all around the Masai Mara to supply Nairobi. So it's prosperity, not poverty, that's killing wildlife. And what we need to do is to make prosperous people want to eat wildlife, if you will, as opposed to eating livestock, and then the wildlife will be there. Or to use that, including the tourism and so on. So that's our, our challenge, is um, how to encourage people there not to convert the land to other uses, but to find a place for wildlife in that land. And it'll probably end up with mixed ranching in places or mixed mix systems. And that could be mining and wildlife, it could be crop farming and wildlife and what have you. There you go. Yeah, thank you so much for touching that point of converting land. Because if we look at the IPBES assessment, we see that one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss is this conversion of land. Of course. Yeah. So for us to continue with conservation, we need to promote ways of generating economy that allow us to keep the land for conservation purposes, although we benefit from it. Andrea, you wanted to say something. I'm going to... I was going to build exactly the way you just did in terms of the land conversion, um, even adaptation, climate adaptation. So some of the adaptation strategies that people are adopting are pushing... Um, human activities into areas that previously wouldn't have had those human activities and that creates increased um, likelihood of, of human wildlife conflict. So it's a complex dynamic that's underway and one that in a systems way, if you address it through use or non-use values for wildlife, you change the dynamic of decision-making at that household and individual level in ways that change the um yeah the 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 friction with wildlife and and yeah it's it's also because of simple population numbers um we're, we're looking at um human population growth that that's pushing people and and human activities into corridors and consumption patterns are part of that 
as Frank's. Yep. So there's a question about mining. I want to get the one there about keeping mines out of parks. You can actually, if you play right, you can actually get mining with wildlife and enhancing wildlife. But you've got to think it very cleverly. And I'll give you a quick example in Guinea in West Africa, where they do bauxite mining. And the big um, iconic species is a ch um, chimpanzee. What we were looking at there was actually finding that the main impact on the chimpanzee was the deforestation of the slopes of the hills that were then converted to producing rice and maize for the locals. Rice, maize, and marijuana, I should say. They do a lot of marijuana production there as well, um, which is quite interesting to see the interspersed crops. But we could have helped with the local communities to convert some of that habitat back for chimpanzees here while we mined over there. So there was a mining company looking at not just doing offsets and saving some chimpanzee reserve elsewhere in the country, but actually doing an integrated community conservation program that would allow mining and enhance habitat for chimpanzees by working with the local communities. So these things are, you can do it. You can, you can, Every one of these, there's no angels on the on the planet, no angels in Africa. We've just got to look at each landscape, say, how do we, what what can we structure here that's going to encourage the people on that landscape to keep wildlife with them? Do they need to look at it? Do they need to eat it? Do they need to get extract mining and do it in a responsible way with both mitigation measures on site and offsets off site and so on? So it's 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 looking for the solutions, and there's loads of opportunities once you start looking for those solutions. Yeah, I know. We continue with this discussion will never end. <laughs> we have reached toward the end, and I'd love to thank everyone who attended. And just summarizing some of the take-home messages from me that we unpacked that really what life um, uh, economy or biodiversity economy. It's not just about money, it's about ensuring that we manage and we conserve the species and the habitats as well. It's about ensuring that there is benefit to that, that go to the people who often stay close and around these areas. We mentioned a few key points that are very important for this economy to strive, which are important for young people to engage in. We engage in the issues of allowing policy environment, in the issues of governance, uh, uh, private public partnerships, and the financing mechanisms. And Andrea unpacked some of those that exist in the continent. We also interestingly take a look around Africa to see the different nature of biodiversity economy activities that are happening. And we did see that we have more consumptive ways and non-consumptive ways. Of course, tourism is the most famous of them all, but I believe today we got to hear and learn about more other activities under biodiversity economy. So on my side, thank you so much for attending and thank you so much to our speakers for uh, sharing this um, uh, great information with us. I hope you have a great session summit and yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mangala. Great. There Lovely to see everybody. There are sessions up right now. So go back to the breakout session if you want to join us. And to all of you, thank you so much for joining, for watching. And to the speakers, thank you for this incredible session. Bye. Bye. Bye.